Hello and welcome to Castles and Legends. Today we are in Scotland, in the capital city in Edinburgh. You can see the castle behind me, so we are at Edinburgh Castle. There is so much history here dating back so far. It's been a royal residence since at least 1093 and it's said to be the most besieged place in Great Britain. It is also a really popular tourist destination, the second most in the UK, only second to Tower of London. So I think we should go and see what it's all about and find out about the history. Edinburgh Castle stands prominently on top of Castle Rock, an extinct volcano. The summit is surrounded by rocky cliffs to the south, west and north, which rise to a height of 80 metres, creating natural defences. During the 1990s, evidence was discovered that there had been a settlement on the site during the Bronze Age, possibly as early as 900 BC, which would make it the longest continuously occupied site in Scotland. In the 1st century AD, there was an Iron Age settlement and fort based on top of Castle Rock, but there is no record of any Roman interest here during this period. The Welsh poem, Egadovan, tells the tale of the Godovan kings, who, it is thought, resided at the fortress, Din Eden, as it was then known on Castle Rock. In around 600 AD, following a year of feasting, the king and his warriors set out to battle the Angles at Catreff in Yorkshire. The mighty Godovan warriors never returned. The poem goes on to tell how they were massacred in the battle. In about 640 AD, Oswald, the Anglo-Saxon king of Benicia captured Castle Rock. The English then added Burra, meaning fortress, to the castle's name, and the site became known as Edinburgh. The first documentary evidence of a royal castle at the site comes during the reign of King Malcolm III. In 1093, King Malcolm III and his eldest son were in Northumberland fighting the English, and both were killed. After hearing the devastating news, his wife, Queen Margaret, died from grief three days later. Queen Margaret, also known as the Pearl of Scotland, had been no ordinary queen. She was loved by the people and did much charitable work and was a devout Christian. In 1250, she was canonised and became a saint. Malcolm and Margaret's youngest son became King David I. And during his reign, from 1124 to 1153, he transformed Edinburgh Castle into a major royal fortress. Most of the buildings constructed during this period would have been built from timber. The only documented building built of stone was St Margaret's Chapel, which David built in honour of his mother. The chapel still stands today on the highest part of the rock and is the oldest part of Edinburgh Castle. In 1174, King William, known as the Lion, was forced to sign the Treaty of Valais and surrender Edinburgh Castle to the English after he was captured at the Battle of Annick. The castle remained in English King Henry II's control for 12 years until, in 1186, it was returned to William as a dowry for his English bride, Ermengarde de Beaumont. In 1286, King Alexander III died suddenly without a clear air, leaving the throne empty. This led to the great cause where rival noblemen put forward their claims to the throne. King Edward I of England was invited to adjudicate and chose John Balliol, Lord of Galloway, who was crowned King John in November 1292. King Edward used this opportunity to attempt to ascertain himself as a feudal overlord of Scotland. Eventually, King John's lords rose up in rebellion against this and Edward was further angered by the relationship between Scotland and France becoming closer, as at the time, France was England's rival. King Edward launched an invasion of Scotland and so began the First War of Scottish Independence. Edinburgh Castle was surrendered to the English in June 1296, following three long days of bombardment in order to put down the Scottish, Edward removed the National Archives, the Crown Jewels and the ancient symbol of Scotland's monarchy, the Stone of Destiny, and took them to London. 
After 18 years of being in English control, Edinburgh Castle was finally recaptured by the Scottish in March 1314 by Sir Thomas Randolph, Earl of Moray and nephew of King Robert de Bruce. Thomas assembled a surprise attack in the dead of night. He and about 30 men were guided from the bottom of Castle Rock up a secret route on the north face by William Francis. Randolph's men then scaled the steep wall. At the top of the castle, the guards never imagined anyone would be able to enter the castle from the steep rocky cliffs and therefore they were not expecting or prepared to be attacked. The surprise attack worked and Randolph and his troops took control of the castle. Edinburgh Castle was now back in the hands of the Scottish King, Robert de Bruce, and he immediately ordered the castle's destruction so that it could never be reoccupied by the British. The only structure left standing was St Margaret's Chapel. The castle was left in this ruinous state for the next 20 years. Following Robert's death in 1329, there was again a dispute over the crown's succession and the English king, Edward III, used this opportunity to invade Scotland. The Second War of Scottish Independence began. In 1335, Edinburgh Castle was back in the hands of the English and they set about rebuilding the fortress from scratch. The English did not hold the castle for long. In 1341, Sir William Douglas came up with a cunning plan to take back the castle. Douglas and 200 men disguised themselves as merchants from Leith. They were eagerly welcomed into the castle with their supplies in their disguise. Once the Scots had crossed the drawbridge, they halted and jammed the portcullis open to allow a larger, nearby hidden force to join them and retake the castle. In 1357, the Wars of Independence came to a close and Robert de Bruce's son, David, became King David II. David chose Edinburgh as his capital and began rebuilding Edinburgh Castle. David's tower was meant to be his residence, although it was not completed before his death in 1371. He also built a number of other towers, including the Well House Tower and Constable's Tower, where the Portcullis Gate now stands. In 1437, the six-year-old James II was crowned king, following the assassination of his father, James I. As James was too young, to make the decisions needed to rule, political power was shared between William Crichton and Sir Alexander Livingston. Crichton wanted to quash any political power the noble Douglas family might have or gain, so in November 1440, an invitation to dinner was sent to the 16-year-old William, 6th Earl of Douglas and his younger brother. The legends say that the boys were getting on well with the 10-year-old King James, when the boys were presented with a very strange dish, a bull's head. This was a signal and the Douglas boys were seized. The young King James begged Crichton to release the boys, but his pleas went to no avail. The Douglas boys were dragged to Castle Hill and beheaded. This horrific event became known in history as the Black Dinner. Following this bloodshed, you might expect James to be more sympathetic to the Douglases but it was James who personally killed William Douglas, the 8th Earl, in 1452, and in 1455 he besieged all major Douglas strongholds, thus crushing any remaining power the Douglas family had. During this period, construction continued at the castle. Crown Square was laid out, royal apartments were built, and a great hall was in existence, although it was not completed until the early 16th century. In 1464, the current approach road up the northeast side was built. James II was also well known for loving guns. Behind me here is Mons Meg, the ultimate weapon of mass destruction for its day. It arrived in Scotland in 1457 as a wedding gift for King James II. Cannons were also to be James's downfall. In 1460, he had laid siege to Roxburgh Castle. 
He was standing close to one of his cannons when he ordered it to be hastily fired. The cannon exploded, killing James. Edinburgh Castle was increasingly used as an arsenal factory and by 1511 it was the principal plant in Scotland. At around the end of the 15th century, King James IV built Holyrood House about a mile away from Edinburgh Castle. Today the two are connected by the road known as the Royal Mile. Holyrood offered more comfortable and palatial accommodation and the royal family began to stay there more frequently. In around 1503, James IV, aged 30, married Margaret Tudor, aged just 13, and the eldest daughter of King Henry VII of England. The marriage was meant to bring peace and unity between England and Scotland, but things did not go to plan. In 1513, James was in the Battle of Flodden, fighting the English army of Henry VIII, Margaret's own brother, and there he was killed. The crown passed to James V, who died in 1542, and so the crown passed to his one-week-old daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots. King Henry VIII of England attempted to force a dynastic marriage on Scotland, but the Scots refused, and Henry invaded Scotland. In 1561, the Catholic Mary returned from living in France to begin her reign. In 1565, Mary married Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. Darnley is said to have quickly grown arrogant and dissatisfied with his position of king consort. The following year, Mary gave birth to a son, James, in Edinburgh Castle. It is believed she chose to stay in Edinburgh Castle for the birth for safety as she was facing rebellions from powerful Scottish nobility. In 1567, Darnley was murdered, and three months later, Mary married James Hepburn, 4th Earl of Bothwell, who was a key murder suspect, although whether she chose to marry him or was forced to is debated. Many Scottish nobles rebelled against Mary and she was forced to abdicate. Mary fled to England, but some Scottish nobility still supported her cause. Scotland was divided on its beliefs about who should be monarch. James with Regent Moray and later the Regent Earl of Lennox ruling until he came of age, or Mary. Sir William Kirkcaldy of Grange was appointed Keeper of Edinburgh Castle. Grange initially supported Moray's claim to the throne, but switched sides. This conflict resulted in what became known as the Lang Siege. The Regent King's side appealed to Queen Elizabeth I of England for help, and Elizabeth sent ambassadors to negotiate. A brief truce was called, but it expired in January 1573 and hostilities returned. Grange began bombing the town and the King's forces prepared for a siege, building trenches and poisoning St Margaret's well. In April, 1,000 English troops arrived to aid the King's cause and artillery was placed in various positions. On the 22nd of May, the south wall of David's Tower collapsed and the following day, Constable's tower was reduced to a pile of rubble. Grange held out after all hope was lost and his remaining men threatened to mutiny. Finally, on the 28th of May, Grange surrendered Edinburgh Castle. Once again, the castle was rebuilt, including the new Half Moon Battery and the Portcullis Gate. In 1603, James V of Scotland also became King James I of England and he moved his residence to London. James's son, King Charles I, visited Edinburgh Castle in 1633 for his Scottish coronation. Charles held a grand feast in the Great Hall and spent the night at the castle. This was the last time a reigning monarch has spent the night at the castle. In 1639, Charles tried to reform the Scottish Church. Many objected to this and a document was drawn up the National Covenant. Those who signed the document became known as the Covenanters. Civil war broke out between the two sides. The Covenanters besieged Edinburgh Castle twice. In March 1639, the Covenanters' leader, Alexander Leslie, arranged a parley with the Royalist Constable. However, this was a trick, 
and Leslie used the opportunity to plant a bomb that blew off the main gate and allowed Leslie's troops to flood through the gate and take control of the castle. The following year, Edinburgh Castle was back in Charles's hands, under the control of a new commander, Lord Ettrick. Once again, the Covenanters laid siege to the castle. The people of the town had grown weary and unsympathetic to Charles's cause, so Charles ordered Ettrick to fire on them, which he did. The Covenanters then tried another tactic. They undermined the spur to enter the castle. The Royalist defenders had already made plans for such an approach and trapped the besieging Covenanters. The siege continued, but became more of a mere blockade. However, after three months, Ettrick surrendered. Although Charles had not been very popular with many Scots, they were still horrified when he was executed in 1649 by Parliament. Charles' son was declared King Charles II of Scotland, which angered Oliver Cromwell, the general of the new Commonwealth of England, and Cromwell launched an invasion of Scotland. Edinburgh Castle was once again under siege. This time the siege lasted for three months. Cromwell's first manoeuvre was to attempt undermining from the south, but the Scots dropped a barrel bomb and the mine collapsed. Next he assembled an artillery fort at the top of the Royal Mile to fire on the castle. No return shots were made for fear of damaging churches and local residents. The castle governor surrendered despite having enough supplies to hold out. In 1660, Charles II was restored to the throne as King of England and Scotland. From around this point until 1923, a full-time standing army was garrisoned at the castle. In 1688, the Catholic King, James VII, was deposed and exiled in what is known as the Glorious Revolution, in which James's Protestant daughter Mary and her Dutch husband, William of Orange, became the only ever joint sovereigns. These events led to the first Jacobite Rising. In 1689, Edinburgh Castle was held by the Jacobite, Duke of Gordon, but was besieged by the new monarch's forces and their heavy arsenal, which included mortars. Three months later, all food and water supplies were running scarce and Gordon surrendered the castle. In 1715, another Jacobite rising began with a rather embarrassing attempt to capture the castle. Approximately 100 Jacobites, led by Lord Drummond, set out to scale the castle walls with assistance from members of the castle garrison. A rope ladder was dropped down from the castle, but it turned out to be too short. The final Jacobite rising in 1745 was led by Prince Charles Edward Stuart, otherwise known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. His army captured Edinburgh without a fight and he attempted to blockade the castle. Inside the castle was General George Preston, who opened fire on a number of Jacobite positions within the town. The Jacobites lacked the necessary siege guns and so called off the blockade and marched south. This was the final time that Edinburgh Castle was ever besieged. The castle's military functions continued and the castle vaults were used to hold prisoners of war several times. In 1995, the castle became part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Old and New Towns of Edinburgh. So we've just come out of the castle. We spent, I think, about just over three and a half hours there. You could spend longer if you want to read about every exhibition in there. There's a lot to see in there and if you like military history then there's a lot on that a number of exhibits and museums in there the views over edinburgh are incredible a lot to see and do here very enjoyable if you've enjoyed this video today please give us the thumbs up hit that like button and subscribe if you've not already and i'll see you again on another adventure